I'm Tamima and this is a Real Talk. Tonight, we get real on an issue that is affecting a lot of young people in this country, addiction. My guests get candid on their struggle with addiction and how they overcame it. My name is Kevin. I'm uh, a I love in this life, I uh, notice that uh, uh, if you want to know somebody's uh, co addicted, Kiasi Evi, I want to engage in drugs or something uh, illicit. Uh, me most, uh, mostly, um, I notice time when I your bro, I'm a Yakuzo, I'm a best chair, I'm a quack abnormal. I'm a as in a tough person in a way that see, see normal. I um, recommend Cynthia, and I think according to my opinion, you start noticing someone's. Uh, addiction when his or her behavior starts changing like maybe eating habits and uh, general behavior yeah wanga venades and in my opinion I, need, I think you notice someone is addicted when they become over self defensive like if they have done something they deny it Thanks for tuning in tonight. My first guest is David Kinudia. He's 21 years old. He has struggled with drugs, and today he's actually a reformed drug user. So, uh, David, welcome to the show. Thank Yours you. is a very interesting story because at just 21, men, you've lived life. So, Pengine Niambie, at which age did you first start using drugs? I was 15 years old, Kwanza. I was glue. Then from 15, ka uh, notice glue ilikuwa yani ukitumia unasikia aibu yani ilikuwa a bit shameful so nika nikaacha nika graduate to bang na pia kukula under spear mira na hii bangi when you when you started using the bang uh -huh. kuna mtu nyumbani ali notice eh hey, squeeze the v kuna kitu anatumia oh kwa hiyo time nilikuwa nimepotea home na nikaingia street eh nikaanza ku survive ronga Nika notice wa se wa uko wana nijua sana. So nika shift kutoka ronga. Nika ingia ngongo. Mbono ulitoka home? Home. Eh, nikuwa 15 years. Nilikuwa na hile aja kwanda kucheza PS. PlayStation. Sana. So de moda nika iba set book za bro yangu. Nika enda nika uza. Nika hepa home vile niliongo pa yo story. Mejulikana. Na nika ingia street. Lafu nika kwa introduced kwa, kwa, kwa yu story ya glue. Na bui flani ya likuwa na jitanga atoni. Pia ya likuwa street child? Ya, yeah, ya yeah, likuwa veto tuko. So nikiwa 17 years. Nika, yu dendo nilipiga role ya kwanza. So ya, ya, ya bang? Ya, yeah. mm -hmm. ilikuwa usiku tu kulikuwa na baridi. So nika vuta, nika sikia hii kofiti ya dikushinda glue. After nimetana 18 years, sasa nika, nika rudi home, ronga. Kudi home ronga nikapata Buddha me, me dead 2011. So, yangu waka decide kukana mimi. Lafu nikanza kwa admire pia life ya naishi ni mse ya likuwa na shika shika tudo sana. So, ile tukicha piana de moja sanane hivi hapo mchana. Haka kuja na marifu wake wengine. Mita. Yani mabeshti zake e, sasa? Ma marafiki yani. Kwa bigi tu. Kaingia, wakatulia, nikuwa na pika chai hapo, nikikudia kwa savu huku sitting room. Nika pata story walikuwa na ongea kwa anza wakatulia. Lafo kanyambi, awe, si urudi hivo. Malize kubonga, ndo moja haka mshu wapana. Huku janata naka mfiti sana. Hata naka mjanja. Kwa hitu si mchapie di likona. So, pia milika kuwa nina hile haji tuwe, si mnipeleke na rada vile kunaenda. Through your cousin and his older friends, you were introduced to crime. Yeah, but in kuwa kuzango wa kuwa nataka, but marafiki zake pia wali mwenye sha ubo ya kofit kwa kwenye tunenda kufanya. So, nipua kikimu introduced to kolewa. Na nini wali kuwa nenda kufanya? So, yo day, wali kuwa nenda hit flan, ibezi na jitanga kitengela glass. Kwa kanyambe watantumia kama bait, yo day, kuna mali watenda wani drop, wani ate, lafuwa kisha wani ate hapo, wawo wataenda. Mi, nitafute plani ya kurudi mpaka base plani kulikuwa na center tu so ile design ni kwa nikianza niki kurudi vile tumekaa nikaona lights za gari so nikasimamisha wakati ile unlock gari niingie nikastukia sewa mingi na mimi ndani pia kwa hapo sikuwa nimeelewa kenye inaendelea juu uko tu huyo mama alikuwa good samaritan na nakusaidia alikuwa njenga lift mimi lijua ni lift kwanza 
Julia Mboni tafute vile ndarudi tu. Wao kuna mali wameamua kufika. Huyo madama anasema huyu kijana hata ana makosa. Gari ni yangu hata huyu tu ni mseni kwa anampea lift acho tu aende akasema hapana. Yeye amaza na endelee kuendesha gari. So tukaenda tukienda kabisa au si vile wanaenda wanaenda kiongea mimi nasikia hii sauti kuna mali ni kwani nimesikia mali tu. Jubado mkiingia kwa gari au kwa unajua ni wao. Unajua tu niwezi sasa. Eh msiko anajua ni nani. Lakini sio ukiwa pale chini ya kiti ndio kaanza kushikanisha. Eh bado nilikuwa nimepanic pia. Sikia tu roho inagonga no kisikiza hii sauti na nikanotisu jamaa kuna mali nimesikia sikia sauti kama hii pia. Ndio huyo mmoja akaninua sasa. Avile alininua nikaangalia sura anazijua nilikuwa nimezimit masana na mta. So tukaenda tukafika bei zingine hapo tukasimama kashuka kila mtu hadi wao na no madam pia akaingizwa kwa gari fulani hapo alafu paka kam field fulani ikagalait ndokuje ka slow ndo mkuzo akashuka hapo sasa nikajua mkuzo ka hako basi niko fit wakati huo madam hapo hapo kwa hiyo giza si tukaenda sasa sikujua nini ilifanyika so mkifika home hiyo siku uliweza kazini yako bado nilikuwa tu bado nilikuwa na tense tu siko mm. najua ni nini itafuata next Kisato fulani hapo wakakuja haka njenga do. Ea, haka nambia hile mishoni ilivana. Bado so, hile ya kwanza, hile gari ya hile mama sasa. Ea, mm haka -hmm. nambia hile onaje ya wera hiko fiti, nika mbe hiko pua. Lakini jo umentema inje sana. Hakuwa, de ingine ni gani ya mnaenda kuchukua gari ingine, haka nambia tulia, nita kuchapia. So, nika ona hiyo form pia ni jambu. So, at that point, we mwenye uka kubali sasa kurekrutiwa. Yeah, na bado uko natumia drugs hiyo time. Eh yeah, bado nilikuwa napiga tire. De vile leo nikikongelesha na joy you're reformed. Yeah. So at, at a young age you nitumia drugs ukaingia life ya crime. Mm. Lakini ni, ni moment gani yenye ilikufo sasa wewe u realize eh nikiendelea nikiendelea down this road nitakufa. Mm. Because so, I'm sure hata mabeshte wenyu wenye mlikuwa mnadaga kufanya hizo ma hit now kuna wengi wale walianguka pia. Yeah, ni wengi waliangushwa including kuzoa mimi pia mwenye alikuwa close na mimi pia yeah, aliangushwa. Hiyo 2014 April mkuzo wangu alinitia ali, ali hit flani hapo nikaenda. Wakati nilienda tukapiga vizuri sana. Na kigojea share mimi nika, nikaenda kabete hiyo siku. Kwenda kabete nikapata sasa job ndogo tu ya kuchukua hizo Glocks hizo magazine kutoka base fulani ya Kobuchari ziteremshadi karibu Spring Valley nikitembea kwa road nikamit makarao fulani hapo kwa wili mmoja alikuwa na uni huyu mwingine alikuwa civilian tu wakanihanda wakaanza kuniambia mi nitoe bangi niko nazo nini so ile time wananza kusua kwa jacket nilikuwa nimevaa huyo mmoja akaguza akafinya kabisa kaude kaniambia toa hii Kenya Kenya iko hapa toa. Nilasikia ni chuma. Eh sasa vile aliambia ni toa mwingine akakuwa kwa rada. Akako AK alafu akanipointishia. Sasa singefanya ile kuonyesha yenyewe nimekubali. Ilibaki nitoe jale, nikaitupa chini alafu nikainua mkono nikapiga magoti. Huyo mmoja akaisaksua akaniambia oh ni bunduki uko nao sasa toa bunduki. Toa bunduki akanigonga hapa ndali ni gonga nikaanguka nikalala tu hata sasa jele nilikuwa nasikia kenye inaendelea but hakuna kitu ningefana au mada fulani hapo walikuwa na mmoja alikuwa mbeba mtungi akasema afande msiue huyo kijana nini amefanya sasa sijui akaelezea waelezea hapo kando alafu akasema hapana huyu kijana mpelekeni tu pale atasema basi mpelekeni huko sikuna CID huko ataenda atasema nikapeleka huko kwa CID Okay ni interrogate tu. Ya, mina wambia, kuna kitu na jizo staff nilikuwa nimeokota nilikuwa napeleka Spring Valley Valley Police Station. Yaani ulikuwa tu messenger. Ah niliwambia mimi nilikuwa nazipeleka Spring Valley Police Station kwenda ku report niko nazo. Kaniambia hapana. Utatoa bunduki. So akanileta juu akanifanya tocha. Wakaona siwezi bonga ndio nikapelekwa Kibira after hiyo wiki. Nilika wiki mzima bila kupelekwa court. Nilikuwa Kibera wakasema hapana pele kwa milimani nikatremsha milimani low courts nikafunguliwa file huko alafu sasa nikarudi nikapele kwa inda jela ndogo na sasa hizo mwili ni ndogo so akafikia wewe bado niko na mwili ndogo hata sasa ina mwili ndogo <laughs> mm. so nikapele kwa uh, nikapele kwa 
nikashinda nikatulia 21 days alafu nikarudishwa tena kodi hiyo judge akasema hapana huku jana arudishwe nikapewa date nyingine mbali siju 23rd month kama mbili sasa tena eh nikiwa hapo nikainua mkono nikasema hapana mimi sidai kurudi huko ndafutiwa hata kani mali ka juvenile hivi ama approved nipelekwe kwanza at least nyewe nitulie huko juu huko ninahofia huko tena wewe ndo mdogo ukienda huko sasa kwa sasa ni ile naonyesha bado pia mimi ni mnyonge mm. sawa kani nikaambiwa ndapelekwa malipo ni toka bete children's remand nikapelekwa huko nikakaa hiyo month ikaisha hiyo month nyingine ikaisha nikarudi tena koti milimani niko nimerudi huko nikapatana na madam fulani hapo wa social work akanielezea vile ati ataniokolea ama vile atansaidia yani mimi nikaweka hiyo trust kwake kabisa so nikamwambia nene ukweli mimi ni vitu nilishikwa nazo ni hivi na hivi na hivi akaniambia wewe utaenda tu uombe hivyo yaona so wakati nilirudishwa koti iko tena hiyo wiki nyingine nikakuja nikasema vile niliambiwa ni sema yani vile nilikonvinciwa konvinciwa nikakuwa sentence sasa sentence ilikuwa gani 25 25 years yeah, short term ilika almost one year and a half sasa kwa jela sasa eh, sasa si sasa hiyo na serve tu mm. the modern kabonga na madam flani hapo bado wa social work tena huko alikuwa na kama kutembea akifanya missions akaniambia kuna function iko hiyo Nairobi students remand kuna function iko huko na so nikaikuwa kwa hiyo list wakati tulienda hiyo function miongoni mwa wale walikuwa wamekuja kutembea wageni kulikuwa na sasa jama fulani alikam anaitwa Njoro nikamuelezea vile yeye life nimepitia na nini so akaniambia hata yeye anakonga na vijana wamekuwa street na yeye amesikia life yangu pia si mchezo mm. kuna venye yani hata mimi nimekapitia akaniambia unajua maboyo wangu kadhaa kati ya wenye nilikuwa nakwambia uoga ninakuoga nao walishikwa na sasa wako huku ndo nimekaa mkuona mm. so akakaa akishughulika story ya maboy wake akaniambia hadi yako naweza shughulikia tu so ulijipataje umetoka jela so ndo hiyo sasa through njoro ndo mimi naweza sema tu nilitoka na hapo sasa ndo ukirilisiwa ukarilisiwa kwa custody ya njoro eh miaka mbili na nusu ilikuwa imeisha nikiwa nikiwa tu ndani wakati nilipelekwa koti yaona tu ali aliuliza huyo jamaa mwenye amesema ako na rehabilitation ni nani so aka njoro akasimama katikati ya watu akasema ni eh lafu akaulizwa kama ako willing kani ukweli ako willing ku, kunisaidia juu hata niko fit yani sikuwa na tabia na conduct yote mbaya huko so akasema eh hey, yako willing kabisa nikaulizwa sasa kutoka kwako wewe unaweza sema nini nikasema mimi nye, ni nikipoa hii chance na na serikali mimi ndarudi shule so niliachiliwa 2016 na ukarudi shule nikarudi shule imagine nilirudia class 7 sasa ni kufum tu. Sasa iko form tu. Na ulirudi class 7? Yeah. So that was David's story. Next I want to introduce my next guest, Moses Mwangi, who is 20 years old and like David, he's also struggled with drug abuse. Moses, welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you. So you're 20 years old and you're saying that uh, you have used jet fuel, you've used bang, alcohol and you started using drugs at 13 years. Yes. So what made you pick up your first drug of choice? So it happened back in 2011. Ikawa sasa nimemaliza class 8. Vile nilimaliza tu class 8 nilijalisha kwenda form 1. Nikawa pain wazazi wa rigonjeka babangu akapata diabetes, mamangu la yeye akakuwa na high blood pressure. So ikakuwa ni ngumu kukidhiare mahitaji ya mtoto hapo na pia na dawa zao za kila mwezi. So mimi nika drop kwa street nikatafuta kazi. Yaani uli, uli hepa nyumbani sasa. Ili hepa sikuambia likienda. Mm -hmm. Nika hepa juu nilikuwa nimedokezewa na bisti yangu ati nakuru kuna kazi za mjengo. Mm -hmm. So nikapiga sabu nikaona yeye badala kushinda hapa nilime acha tu niingie street niende mjai mimi bin nawasaidi. Nifika tu tao mambo ikanibadilikia nikajipata base. Nikapata wale mabisti wangu wenye wananipea keroma wananiambia sasa huku tunatumia gaina hii ndio upate usingizi juu na rara chini kuna place place tulikuwa tunaita base machuma. Bez machuma ni soko so imejengwa kama vitanda hizo kuzia nguo sasa unalala juu mm -hmm. ni baridi so inabidi utumie dawa ndo upate usingizi so that's when i introduced myself to musi 
tunaita msio wenye wanaita mafuta ndege mm-hmm. lakini definitely si mafuta ndege ni vile tu jina mm-hmm. so mimi nikajipata nimevuta msi nikasikia bado ni form ju nikivuta nasikia ninalewa tena na lala that's why and i got addicted sasa kidogo hivi kukaa kwa street kidogo kidogo nywele ikamea so nikakuwa mrasta sasa <laughs> na bado ni rasta leo <laughs> kukuwa mrasta sasa jina rasta jina mosa ikapotea uh-huh. kwa soko sasa nilikuwa beba ikapotea ikaingia jina ras sasa lazima utembee la babishte wako wa rasta na walikuwa wanavuta nini walikuwa wanavuta bangi mm. so lazima ukae kama wao juu usipovuta bangi watakuita msolo kwa nini wewe uvuti bangi la si tunavuta inamaanisha wanataka kutuset mm. na sasa ili unana sababu unataka kukaa base you just have to stay like them bangi kaingia mta nikavuta shash kapanda class sasa nikawacha ile ambao sasa nikaingia atoni sasa nikavuta hivyo hivyo nilikuwa naenda kusikizeleke club fulani hapo hivi aroba ngoma ikishika sana nikajipata tena nimeingia kwa tei pombe ikaingia kwa kichwa so you can imagine those things unaishi kwa street unatoa wapi hiyo yote ya kwa hizi vitu zote mimi nilikuwa nachangamka kwa stage kwa soko nilikuwa na bebea watu mzigo kama u beba mwezangu alalipisha 50 minta kulipisha mbao chini ya maji so mm. that next day ukikuja utanitafuta ras unaona mm. sasa nilikuwa natupata tu pesa which singeweza hata ku save unaona ukilala nje utalala zibiwe maybe msako ikuja kulikuwa kuna kuja na msako kulikuwa na serikali ya mtaani wale wenye kusema sasa unaona wakubwa wetu wanakuja wanawapiga na wanapora kila kitu so inabidi tumia hizi pesa to the forest zishe sasa so, unapata na kula mbao kuna kunywa mia so kwa sababu afadhali utumie wewe afadhali utumie kwa nini wewe umetumia kuliko mwanaume akuja atumie jasho yako nyomechoka na yeye ajafanya kazi and how long were you on the streets for wow i was in the street about seven years because nilihamia Nairobi sasa so from age 13 to age 20 yeah that's when i came to Nairobi bado natumia mavitu kuingia kikomba sasa hapo nilikuwa na sukuma mkokoteni by the way hata kuna beast yangu nilikuwa naenda kusikiza reggae i love reggae niko naenda kusikiza aka notice there's something different with this boy akaniambia wewe ukiacha kutumia hiki kitu na kufunza kunyoa mm. so mimi nilikuwa nimetamani sana kujua kunyoa nikawaacha for the time being nikajua kunyoa nika perfect akanipea kazi lakini ile addiction ikanivuruta tena ikanionyesha ukikunywa kwa kanusu utaweza ku attract customer eh. nikasahau nikikujua kanusu kuna harufu inatoka ndani ya mdomo nikakimbia nikapiga jabel nusu nikarudi kwa job jamaa akaniambia sasa tuwezi fanya kazi hivi because pia customer afurahi wa nusu yeah, afurahi mm-hmm. wewe ni mlevi unaona sasa hizi fanyika sasa mimi kwa natana nimefutwa ndio yule nikashuka class kutoka kwa pombe hadi kwa msi tena sasa nimerudi bezi yake kwa chini na ingine ya mudhuru inaitwa maboxini sasa hapo ndio nilikuwa na lala na vuta msi bangi ndio hiyo sasa ulevi kita mizizi sasa nikakuwa street student nikaacha kusukuma mkokoteni nikachukua gunia kuokota chupa tao sasa hiyo ndio ilikuwa haso mm-hmm. until now tukapatana na teacher njolo I remember it was on Sunday. Sasa kwa base kuna ile chachi na kuja kuchukua machokora. Wanaenda wanakula wanarudi. So me it happened that me nilikuwa napenda ku rap sana. Sasa teacher Njoro akifika alikuta nikiimba. Sasa akaona yule jamaa bado wako form hata kama analewa. Akaniuliza story yangu nikamuelezea akaniambia there's a place called Grobo. Grobo Rehabilitation and Rescue. Unaona? Sasa tukatoka na Njoro tukaingia hapa. So Levi kaisha kwanza. So of course Njoro and also for you David so Njoro is also global hope again yeah, is yeah. the outreach mm. that picks both of you off the street yeah. so mukiingia pale global hope of course unapelekwa through rehabilitation yeah. so hapo una undergo hiyo process ya kuwa rehabilitated kwanza unajua wakati yuko pale upati hiyo time ya kwenda hizo drugs so, so hata wakati nditoka story ya crime nikikuja nikapata wase huko wali, wali reform kitambo hadi nikasema yeye kwani mimi ndo nilikuwa nimechelewa nikawa mimi ndo nilikuwa nimegojea tu because hiyo unaona unaona watu wametoka ile life pia umetoka hardened lakini wana reform so pia unaona even me i can eh na pia wengine pia unapata wengine pia wana story hadi mingi hadi tena kubwa hadi kushinda yako unapata msee ali alipitia hadi mob justice alikuwa karibu kuchomwa so ina ku challenge eh yeah, so ina ku challenge na pia ina ku empower na wana yenyewe hata yangu ni usoto yeah, okay on that note we'll be taking a very quick break still to come here on real talk later we have more guests more stories on struggle with addiction and of course i also have experts in studio who will be putting this issue into perspective don't go too far
Welcome back to Real Talk. Remember, tonight we are spotlighting addiction. And earlier on, two of my guests shared their stories. And as you can see, they started at a very young age. Remember, you can join the conversation via the hashtag hash Real Talk with Tanima on Twitter, Instagram, and on Facebook. Right now, Carol, welcome to Real Talk. Thank you very much, Tamima. A lot of times people will assume that addiction is something that only men or young boys deal with, but not women. But it's something that you've struggled with for years. Maybe please share with us your story. Um, yeah, just to agree with you, um, I, I've been saying lately that addiction is not a respecter of persons. It's also not a respecter of gender. And um, case in point, because I struggled with addiction from the time I was just slightly over 18, I started drinking um, alcohol and smoking cigarettes when I joined from five. We start innocently, and mine was just out of experimenting. So just friends. To see. Yeah, just friends, mm. peer pressure, and peer pressure is real. And um, peer pressure is not only for teenagers, it's also for grown-ups. But for me, mine stems from the fact that I had a very low self-esteem growing up. I actually had none of it. And um, when you have no self-esteem, you basically have no skeleton. As my father likes to call it, you don't have a skeleton. So when anyone says jump, you normally ask how high. And the person who is introducing me to this was the coolest chick in okay. school. So you wanted to be like her. And I wanted to be like her because me, I, was, I always felt like the underdog, quote and unquote. I was the most unpopular, the most ugly, according to people. And so here is this chick and she's so hot and she wants to be my friend. And so because I'm looking for this acceptance and affirmation, we quickly became friends. And then here she was, she was a smoker, she was a drinker, she was everything that I was not. So you were assimilated yes. into all these things that yes. she's doing because yeah. you want to belong. Because I want to belong. At what point did you realize that this thing that started out as a harmless habit is now becoming an addiction? My drinking was hard from the word go. I used to go to pubs and people tell me, I drink pole pole, unakunyangaraka sana. But me, I couldn't understand what they're meaning because by the time someone is taking their second beer, me, I'm on beer number four or number five. So your tolerance biologically was, was already high. was very high from yeah. the word go. My first drink was a bottle of wine at 12%. And it didn't get me high. It didn't even get me tipsy. So it didn't do anything. That's part of why you probably never thought, I could never be an addict. I can handle myself. Yeah, I could handle. And even the yeah. days I used to wake up shaking, I used to think maybe it's because I drank too much. Maybe tomorrow I'll reduce. But when tomorrow comes, hey, tomorrow is even worse than the day before. So I started to a lock very early in my, in my addiction. Okay. Yeah. So now, obviously, did anyone at home now realize that Carol has changed? Um, my dad... My dad noticed it back in 2007, and he wrote me a very long letter. And before the long letter, he first wrote me a text. But you know, you read it when you're high, and you cry for like two minutes. And then after the tears have gone, you forget about it, and you move on. Mm. And then at that time in 2007, I was in a very good job. I was earning quite some good money. So, you know, you know when you're earning and you're in addiction, you're also very arrogant. As part of your story, at some point, you went to study abroad. Yes. And again, your addiction reared its ugly head and it got so bad that yeah. you had to come back. Yeah. Maybe tell us about that. Um, that was, I went to study in Malaysia after Form 6. Um, in Malaysia is where I discovered marijuana and I moved from beers now to spirits. There's a reason they're called spirits, eh? We are truly spirits, those ones. <laughs> So um, mine spiraled to the point of, I was even cut off from class because I couldn't go to class anymore. I used to be a Friday, Saturday kind of a drinker, but now I became a regular drinker. Almost every other day was a drinking day. So obviously you're in a strange country. Yeah. yeah? Where are you getting the money to drink and drink this much, Monday to Sunday? In Malaysia at the time, there were a lot of people from Botswana and um, then the Malays, and they were very friendly towards us Africans. So getting somebody to buy you anything was not was not a big deal. And my best friend at the time was a Malay. Um, God rest her soul. I hear she, she lost the battle in this journey of addiction. Eh? But she was my best friend and she came from a very wealthy family. So she used, to, she used to more or less handle all my bills. And then also you make friends there. You go into a pub, you're an African chick. Then I realized apparently I was very hot because I was 21. I used to wear the small tops and everything. So you always get people too to fund you or to enable your habit. So for me, money was not a problem. As long as it's money for drinking, it will always be there. So at what point in Malaysia did you now come to, come to your senses and say, eh, eh, I, I, I need help? It was not that I need help. Things were thick. Mm. There's a difference. I've been cut off from class. My housemates have moved so out. So you the school No, they didn't, they didn't suspend me, but they uh -huh. said I need to recollect myself because okay. they sensed there was a problem. 
people I was living with in the same apartment. One day I come back from a, a, a foreign town and I come back and I find everyone moved out. Wow. I was left alone. As in, no, people had shibad my habits. Mm. So I communicated back home and I came back home. But it was not about, it was not, I would not call it remorse. It was those sons of sasa kimaumana. Right. Something because needs to be. You're in an give. apartment which you're sharing. Yeah. Now you have to pay it by, yeah. for it by yourself. Yeah. Okay. And then there's also this part of being in a foreign country. It's lonely, by the way. So I had to come back home. At least I knew, even if things are so bad, at least at home, there are people. There's family. Joining us right now is uh, Carol's dad, Mr. James Kagia. As a parent, listening to her talk about her experience, did you know, especially the first time when she went to Malaysia, did you sense anything was off with Carol? Growing up, I think, and in my working experience, I only saw three people in a setup that had about a thousand people who were affected by alcohol. Okay. But still, we did not understand it. Mm. So now here, you are, you are a parent, and occasionally then you realize someone so, has drunk alcohol. Mm. And for me, I drank until about 90, really. That's when I got, I gave my life to the Lord, and I stopped completely. But I had stopped a little way early, about 88. So, So I got saved 10 years into my marriage. I think she's about 10 at that time. And uh, we, we, we are, everything is normal. But then comes this time, which she's talking about. We have taken her to a level in an upmarket school, and she meets that. But again, at that point, we don't notice much. Because she's also hiding it. Yeah, she's hiding it. Yes. So you don't notice much. I think the time we really came to notice was when she was in Malaysia, and we started realizing there is a problem, mm. a big problem. And uh, of course, sometimes you could not get hold of her, we could not communicate. At one point, in fact, we, we were so worried that we thought someone should fly there and see what is going on. Mm -hmm. But there were, we had money constraints, so we could not organize that. Eventually, thank God, she came back. Still, we did not really fully grasp the problem. What is this? Because at that point, you're just cautioning someone if you see something. Because you think it's something that can stop just the way you handle it. Why can't you? You didn't think it was a disease. No, because we did addiction not is a disease. We did not understand. Yeah. And a lot of parents up to now do not understand that this is a disease. So she comes and we take her to college. She does two, was it two diplomas? Yeah, she starts working. That's when now we, we, we noticed it. That this, there is a problem. We look for her. You cannot get her at work. She has abandoned work. You can't get hold of her. At one point, we had to go where she was working, and we told her, she told us she is at home right. taking care of her child. You came from Malaysia, like he said. You, you guys had a discussion. Things didn't go well there, but we are willing to give you a second chance. They pay for you to go back to school. You go back to school, you excel. And then, so how do you find yourself back again, you know, in the jaws of addiction? Here is Carol in her first job. Now she has, predict she has predictable income. Carol still wants to to mix with the Joneses, to be on the same level with the Joneses, okay? Every Friday, people are going out. Carol still has that catharsis for booze. She has never dealt with it because she didn't even know what it was. Me, I'm still thinking, I'm just having fun. So Friday evening, I go out. The plan was not to sleep out, by the way. I had a very small child. Now, considering that I come from a very uh, conservative home, how am I going to knock my father's gate when I'm in that condition? So what happens? I sleep out on Saturday. Saturday, I wake up with a hangover that is so terrible, I can't do anything else than take another one to clear. Your, to, to to, clear. Mm. But that first one is very nice. So before you know it, you start saying, by one o'clock, Aki, I'll be home. By two o'clock, I'll be home. It reaches four o'clock. Five o'clock, you're still saying, then you switch off your phone. Come, Teja. So it's a vicious cycle now. It's a vicious cycle. Sunday, since I've not yet gone home and Monday, I have to go to work. Say, I have money in my account. I go to an exhibition. I buy outfit for work for Monday. Wow. So for you, Mr. Kagia, you being a parent, you picked up on she's not being the best parent that she can be. How are you dealing with that? And especially now that you're part of the church, and I'm sure people talk. So probably somebody must have come to you and told you, hey, your daughter, if she continues down this road, it's not going to end well. It was a very challenging moment. She has left her son, you know, with us. We are taking care of her. And she's on her own, like she's saying, she would come, she would go eventually. Of course, she, she went to be on her own. Uh, the only thing is that we really turned to prayer and we, turned, we stood on the promises of God. 
And the journey continued. It was a long time, like she say. So beyond now yes, yes. counseling her as her parents, at mm. any point did you ask her maybe so to seek professional help? Oh, it came to a point where now I kept talking to her. This is the time now she's alone. She has no job. In her house, she has sold everything. Wow. There's nothing except uh, her bed, a fully furnished house. There's nothing, absolutely. Uh, I'm hearing stories from the neighbors that sometimes it's so bad that she misses her gait. I think that was the lowest point I think she went. So at this point, what <clears throat> was the intervention? So at this point, because you've been talking, every opportunity I got, I would tell her, we can help you, we want to help you. A rehab can help you. Uh, it is at that point now, I think she came to that point of saying, yes, daddy, I want to go to a rehab. So at that moment, you admitted it to yourself and you allowed your family to help you. Yeah, because um, the, the thing with addiction, you know, at some point you come to the realization that you're in trouble. You always know it, but you can't say it to others. And when others say it to you, you get defensive. And then it reached a point, the people I'm seeing on TV are people I've gone to school with. Whenever I read a magazine, it's people I was in class with, not people at who are even ahead of me. People were in the same class with, my desk met behind in front. And I'm like, whatever happened to this chick? This is like got you had me. wasted your life. Yeah. What happened? I mean, I missed out on my 20s, mm. to be honest. I, I can't tell you what my 20s were about. My 20s, there was nothing substantial apart from drinking and smoking. There was nothing about my 20s. And it reached a point, I asked, one morning I just woke up. Because I'd been, by the way, I'd even, I didn't tell you, I thought of how to sell my passport. I'd gotten a Nigerian to buy my passport. Mm. It was going to go for 10 k That I did not know. <laughs> okay, so, well, now he knows. <laughs> <laughs> but it reached a point, yeah. I think, let me tell you, there's something very powerful about prayer. Mm. Prayer works wonders. I used to walk through dark alleys and I'm reading Psalms 23 in my head. Like, let me get to my Yeah, just let me let get, and when I get there, I'm like, thank you, God. Yes. That time I have four moonlights in my bag, or four moonwalkers, or four jebels. I go, I put them on the kitchen counter, I'm like, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> I look at them like this, you know. I had glamorized those things. Mm. But after I opened the first one, just opening the first one, I start feeling guilty. I'm like, I had said, dear God, that I will never take. But let me just finish this round. And tomorrow, the last I'll, time. I kids the last round. Mm. That week before rehab, me, I don't know where I got money from. But I made sure, I made sure so that I grieve for this booze nicely. Mm. Blue moon, all the flavors entered this system. One mm. week to me entering rehab. Dallas, I did it. Moonlight, Moonwalker, Jebel, all of them just to say goodbye. And did you mean it? Yes. Okay. For me, I knew it. That was the end. No, on that note, I want to introduce... On that note, I want to introduce Dr. Elizabeth Koimet. She's the founder of The Serenity Place, which is a rehabilitation center that is based in Nairobi and Nakuru. So Dr. Koimet, welcome to Real Talk. And seeing Carol up here with her father, and knowing that uh, they are actually beneficiaries of what you do, where do you think most families get it wrong when it comes to dealing with addiction? Thank you very much, Tamima. Many parents don't understand addiction. So the minute the child presents with addiction, uh, people look at it negatively. They are negative. They even start hiding things because uh, they think the, the child will steal from them, they lock up houses, they lock up even you know, cupboards and wardrobes. That goes into making the person hardened so that now if they cannot steal at home, they will go to steal elsewhere. Because when you're addicted, you're addicted, you need that drink, you need that puff, you need that cocaine, you need that heroin, you must get it at any cost. So it's actually a disease. It's not tabiambaya, it, like no. we often label it in this society. Like, ule mtutuwa kuna tabiambaya sana. And now, unajua, parents don't understand that it is a disease. Just like somebody can get diabetes. And so a lot of time is lost, yeah? Because if it was addressed right from the beginning, maybe there would have been hope of this person not going through so much. Because you can imagine the agony that Carol and even uh, this young man seated here beside me were, have gone through in order to be what they are today. Absolutely. They are lucky to have made it. 
many, many, many don't make it. What do you do with a parent who obviously is well-meaning and I want to get my child the help and they're not cooperating? So how, how does that work when it comes to rehabilitation? Let me explain something little that um, addiction sometimes, not in all cases, but sometimes may degenerate into a mental illness. Now, when someone is mentally ill, they don't know. You're the one who sees oh, this person, Kichwe Meruka, but the, the person doesn't know it. Now, for the parents, they will need to go past the issue of Tabiambaya to realizing that this is a disease and realizing it that the, uh, I mean, realizing that the faster they work, the better. The faster they arrest this issue, the better. Now, there's a bit of a problem, and I have seen it sometimes in, uh, you know, in our rehab at the Serenity Place, that um, some, some uh, addicts have to be brought by police, literally, you know, handcuffed not all, because as a parent, I realize that my son or my daughter has a problem, but they are not willing to be helped. But I cannot leave them like that because they are going to die. Because the parent cares. Because the parent cares, yeah? So the best thing is to get maybe um, the police to come in and, and actually force them into the rehab. So sometimes, um, you know, that is it's done. It's necessary. It's necessary. So that in those cases, done. do you have successes whereby, yes, the person may have been brought in in cuffs, yeah. but you're able to get through to them? Amazingly. Once many of them, I would say about um, 90 something percent of them, once they go through the, deto the detoxification program, they begin to understand, oh, what was that I was doing, you know? So they get back into their senses Yes, they now. start getting back into their senses. And because in our program, we have what we call education and counseling, during that process, they begin to understand where the son started beating them in the first place. Mm. And now how they can make amends, for example, with their parents or with, their, with the people that uh, they may have offended in their addiction. Okay. Right now, we're going to be taking a very quick break. When you come back, still some more from Dr. Koimet, because we're just trying to understand today what is the science behind addiction? How do you help your loved one? Don't go too far. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Real Talk. Remember, tonight we are spotlighting addiction. We've had stories from different guests tonight, and we're really hoping that we're talking to somebody out there. Well, I want to invite my next guest, who is James Nanzala. James is an addiction counselor, and he specifically works with youth and young people. James, welcome to Real Talk. Thank you very much, Tamima. So I want to get your opinion. Is there an element of addiction which now goes back to biology, whereby some people are actually, through their biology, naturally more predisposed to be addicts? Research has showed that uh, your genetics can predispose you to an addiction, just like your genetics can predispose you to a, any other disease like cancer. At the same time, also the environment that you grow up in socially because we learn by modeling. So from what the parents are doing, then you can acquire it socially. Let me rope in Mr. Kage here, because obviously, Carol is lucky to have you as a parent. There are parents who would not have held as steadfastly as you did with her through this journey of addiction. So is it something that now for you as a parent, and even as a grandparent, and for you, Carol, as a parent, you're conscious of when it comes to now the younger members of your family? For me, I think now, because of the journey that I've walked and uh, being a sober parent now, and with a son who is in, he's actually becoming a teenager next month, I'm very keen in observing everything that goes on with my children. I try my best as possible because I think that is the mistake that people make. Whenever you see your child in a bad mood, don't just assume it's a bad mood. Whenever you see your child is not talking, don't just assume. Don't just come home from work and see your child, hi, how was your day? Good. How was school? Good. Okay. And the story dies. There is more to that child than how was. Take time to go out with your children. 
parents nowadays, especially in my age bracket, people who are 30s, eh, you go out with your kids on Sunday, the kids are in the bouncing castle, you, you're busy on your phone. It was just an outing because you're out of home, but you're not really bonding. The point of the outing was for you guys to connect, talk about things that you can talk about outside of home. You know, when you're out there, you're free. People feel free, people can talk. Me, there are times when I was growing up, I would feel I just want to connect. I just want to see how my day was and really talk about my day. Mm. But I, I never got that. Luckily for me, my son is somebody who talks. The grandfather can attest. The guy can give you stories. Papa, I tell him, keep quiet. <laughs> but through his stories, you get to know what's really going on inside him. Mm. And that is where parents and children, there's a disconnect. Get to really bond with that child. Mr. Kagia, as a parent and somebody who's gone through this not once, not twice, what's that one thing you could tell other parents? So how mm. can parents be more vigilant? For us, we grew up in a very stable environment which was kind of homogeneous. Every family was kind of the same. Mm. And even as we misbehaved a little later, you know, it's just that peer pressure, you want to be like, and that's how we got into some of those things, even drinking. But now the modern parent is, grew, is, 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 is bringing up children in a totally different world with so much pressure, so much going on in terms of drugs and all those things that they have to be ahead of time Ours, we were caught up because we did not even understand what we are it dealing was, with. Yes. Yeah, and of course, as parents, we did not learn anything. We did not know. And many parents, even up to my generation, are stuck there. The young parents now have to really go ahead to learn a lot about what is going on so that they can have their eyes open. They can pick anything going on. We have with us as well in studio, we have Cosmos Ravi. So Cosmos is 31. He's also a recovering addict, Cosmos. So probably tell us, because you've been through the whole walk as well, what was your drug of choice when you were an addict? Uh, me, I was involved with alcohol and cannabis or bang. Okay. Yeah, back in high school. And okay. uh, I, I used it socially up in college life. Uh, that's when uh, I enrolled at uh, emergency medical technician for a course in Kenya Red Cross. That's when, that's when I was involved in an accident. And so after, after that accident, everything came crumbling down. I didn't feel any sin of hope for life. So, I uh, took escalate uh, kunywa na na shada kufuta shada. But at a certain time, I didn't feel it isn't supposed to be like that. So I checked in to a rehab. And right now, I'm, I'm doing a course in addiction counseling. <laughs> So, and probably, let me just talk to all my guests. At the back of your mind, you always know that you have to be careful. Yeah. So how has that work been like for you? With somebody like me who is in recovery, I have to be very careful. I have to evaluate myself mentally and emotionally. Because by the time somebody, there's something we call a relapse. By the time somebody enters relapse, by the time somebody goes to actually use that substance they were using, the relapse happened in their mind a long time ago. Right. So for me, I have to be very careful. I will not say that at there are days I wish I would not go back to being a social drinker. I would, there are times I wish I could. Mm. The know. craving is there. You feel it, it. Sometimes it's there. Yes. You know, um, It doesn't go away 100%. There are times when I'm awesome, but there are days when I'm stressed, and stress is part of life, and there are days when I'm like, I wish I could, but when I remember how far I've come and where I have been, it's not even a thought anymore. Okay. So the best way for somebody to stay away from whatever they were using, is to constantly monitor yourself and surround yourself with people who are genuinely interested in your recovery, not people who are just using you. You know, there are people who are with you to make sure you fall. Yeah. And you have to be very wise about such people. And maybe, James, uh, as a counsellor, what, uh, what are some of the ways that you teach your, the people that you work with? How do you help them stay on course? Uh, a critical part of the program is what we call relapse prevention and management. That is towards the end of the course of treatment. So they are taught about triggers, what triggers are. Number one, they have to identify their triggers because everybody's triggers are unique. So for some people, it would be stress. For some people, it would be their friends. They have to identify them first. And number two, uh, working together with the counselor, they develop a plan to be able to manage that. As Carol has said, Relapse is a process. It's not a one-time occasion. 
So by the time somebody takes the drink, they've already gone through an, what we call an emotional relapse. So signs of emotional relapse could be just uh, stress, emotional turmoil, a bit of loneliness, problems, managing anger. And then the second phase is a mental relapse. By the time they get to a mental relapse, now they start thinking more and more about using, sort of trying to look, of, to look for occasions where they can use and not get caught. Uh, and then eventually now a full-blown relapse happens where they actually take it physically. But that being said, still uh, there's help. If you feel like you're going through an emotional or mental relapse, it's the best time to get help. Even after physical relapse, you can go over the program still. Okay. Yeah. And maybe right now, let me take a couple of questions from the audience. Hi, Tamima. My name is Perpetual Nasimiyu. My first question is that the cost of being in a rehabilitation center. Then my second question is, how long will it take for someone to be rehabilitated? Okay, thank you. Maybe let me throw the first one to Dr. Koimet. The cost of drug addiction or alcohol addiction for that matter, is much, much, much more than the cost of rehabilitation. Because we run a program of about three months for issues to do with alcohol addiction or gambling or even sex. But then there are hard drugs like heroin and cocaine and all those. And those do take a bit of time. Um, when you think about, for example, alcohol addiction, Carol has just told us that yeye alikuwa wale wakukanyanga case in a crate. A crate of beer is so much, and that is only one night, right? And then the harm it does to you. To the, your physical body now. To your physical body. Mm. And then the harm it does to your productivity. That's why she would suck herself out of a job. Yeah, that's why she said she lost her 20s. Absolutely. The three months will take about, perhaps on an average, about 180,000. Yeah, 180,000 only. The good that you know will happen after the three years. Um, far out, outweighs, you know, what you would call the cost. It's a it, cheaper price to pay. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. So let's take uh, a second question from the audience. Hello, Tamima. My question rolls out to the Leoness Carol. I would like you to shed light on your... Um, okay, did you find it jeopardizing to your, expectant, uh, your expectancy? I think probably he's trying to ask... Were you, were, were you abusing when you were pregnant, or is that the period in your life where you had stopped entirely? Alcoholism or any substance abuse is worse for women than it is for men. So chances of a fetus being affected are 99%. Let me throw it back to Dr. Koimet. How intensive is the rehabilitation process? Because you said it's ideally three months, but are there times that the person has to be there longer than the three months? Yes, especially if the person has been using hard drugs, then they have to be there for longer. Because the period of detox may actually be long. Um, getting out of heroin is not a joke. Uh, there are all sorts of um, uh, pains and aches associated with coming, uh, we, I mean, with the withdrawal symptoms. Uh, but the normal program is 90 days, three months, where we follow what we call the 12-step program. In short, it's a period where you begin to re look in on yourself, to become aware of yourself. Many of them come and they forgot about hygiene, you know, simple hygiene, like even in their hair, washing their faces. Some, because of mental illness, what we call psychosis, have already, I mean, don't, don't even want to take a bath, you know? And so that uh, first step will normally uh, take them back to being a human being. 
And then as we continue through the 12 steps, there is um, realizing that I cannot come out of addiction on my own. I am not strong enough. I need a higher power. And therefore, that connection between you and God. And then going on, uh, very, very important, to taking an inventory of yourself. You know, where is it you went wrong? What is it you did wrong? You know, what is it your parents did wrong? Because, you know, in addiction, you're blaming everyone else except yourself. So after you take an inventory of that, you need now to make amends. Right. And this is where we need the family to come in so that uh, Carol is able to tell dad, I'm sorry, dad. I'm sorry for wasting uh, your money in Malaysia. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, you know, for the things that I have done. Maybe talk to her son and tell son, son, I'm sorry. I was going through a bad patch of my life. I had uh, this sickness, but I thank God I'm well now. And then, as the uh, counselor talked about, we end up with what we call re uh, relapse prevention program, where because this person will go out, he will need to be strong, and we will need to have a purpose of going out. For us at the Serenity Place, we are encouraging that if somebody doesn't feel strong enough after the three months or after the time of addiction, they can actually undertake a course as they stay with us. Okay. Just exactly like what Cosmas is mm -hmm. doing. He's able to go to town on his own, come back on, uh, through that matatu, pass that pub, uh, get somebody's, I mean, puffing uh, uh, cigarettes, and be able to say no. For us, that is great. Absolutely. Yes. Well, on that note, we have to wrap up the show. Thank you so much for tuning in. Remember, today's topic is huge. You obviously can't exhaust it in this one sitting. But I really hope that we spoke to somebody out there because we are going into the festive season. Kids are home from schools. And like you had, it starts with one puff. It starts with one drink. It starts with having the wrong friends. So many lives have been wasted. And I think we are fortunate enough because today we have people who've been able to overcome their addiction. They've struggled and they've imagined on the other side as champions. On that note, we have to end tonight's show. Thank you so much for tuning in. Until next time, enjoy the rest of your viewing. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for tuning in for the Real Talk tonight. Welcome to tonight's Real Talk show. I am your host, Faith Koimet. Real Talk, we're going to go through this, uh, this monster addiction. <laughs> we have one of a wonderful guests over here. So stay, stay back and watch. Oh, my God. <laughs>I am Tamima, the host of Real Talk with Tamima, and I would like to invite you to be part of my audience or a guest on the show. All you have to do, if you have a story that is very personal, very powerful, and you want to inspire other people, please reach out to the show via the email address on your screen or the number as well.